wherever you are, have a seat. Uh, take your Bible out if you have a Bible handy on your phone, on your tablet, uh, good old-fashioned paper Bible, uh, whatever you got there. Uh, we'll have, always have the passages on the screen in the worship center and online, but uh, we're going to be looking together. Turn to the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth of the Gospels. The first three called the synoptics, very similar to each other. Kind of, kind of, they kind of tell the story of Jesus in a similar way, but you get to John. Man, just new vistas, new ways of seeing things. And we're going to read John's Christmas story today. And it doesn't sound like the Christmas story from Luke, because there's no camels and wise men, and it's, it's very different. But we're going we're gonna to see this name for our God, who is the Word the Logos. And we're going to go to a deeper place. I want you to imagine as you're turning to John, as you're thinking about, this, about Jesus, about our God as the Word, as the Logos, I want you to imagine somebody who from the time they were born, they were fed fast food. A little two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, fast food, fast food, fast food. 10, 12, 13, fast food, fast food, fast food. 17, 18, 19, 20, fast food, fast food, fast food. Just that, that's, that, they've ate it their whole lives. And then somebody says to them, you know, do you enjoy your, what you eat? And they say, well, it's kind of got a sameness to it. And, it's, uh, and somebody says, do you know there's other food? So what do you mean? And they say, oh, yeah, there's Italian food that has this great sauces. There's, there's, there's sushi. There's, there's uh, th- those tacos. I think that those tacos are veggie tacos for those of you that want the, uh, the more healthy type thing. But you know, somebody says, no, there, there's, there's so much more. And then you, get to t- you start to taste those foods, and you go, I'd never tasted anything like that before. Everything I had up to this point was kind of salty, a lot of sodium. It had a different, you know, it's just different. I hope what happens tonight is when, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've been around a church at all, You've heard the passage we're going to look at tonight. Uh, You've heard this passage about Jesus Christ as the Word, our God, the living Word. The Greek term for that is logos. You say, well, I've I've heard Jesus is the Word of God, and we worship Jesus who's the Word. But but I want to suggest that it might be you kind of are kind of maybe have had a fast food experience, and I want to go to the good stuff. I want to give you a picture of the logos the Word of God, that may take you to places that you haven't really thought of before. All from the first five verses of John chapter 1 and also the 14th verse. Now the whole chapter digs into this. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5 and verse 14. And so Lord, speak to us as we open your Word now. Prepare our hearts to receive what you want to say to us. And we pray that if if our palate and our taste and our experience has become kind of familiar and kind of bland and well we know yeah Jesus you're the word and and God you 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 are the living word you're you're here with us you're the 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 word of God I pray you'll take us to deeper places expand our awareness and understanding of who you are and help us to worship you in response to that we pray this in your name Jesus word of God amen if you have your own Bible in front of you, and if you're a note taker, you can maybe try to underline or highlight where you see something that it says about the Word. Who, who is this Word? When, when, when we worship Jesus, God among us, as the Word, what does that mean? Well, let's look at the passage together. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning, in the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, divine. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Through him, all things were made. If that's not clear, look at what comes next. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. Get the picture? Through him, all things were made. If that's not clear, without him, nothing was made that has been made. All right? Creator of all things. Verse 4. In him was life. And that life was the light of all people, of all mankind. And that light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. No matter what you see on the news screen, no matter what you think in your mind, the darkness has not overcome it. And then verse 14. The Word became flesh. This is the Christmas story for John. It's the birth of God among us. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. 
and we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full, overflowing, full of grace and truth. That's a a 14-week sermon series right there. You could linger on each thing it says about Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We're going to just try to try to kind of pull up to the table and partake of this picture of who Jesus is. When we talk to we talk about God as as the word. What does that mean? Well, when when John inspired by the Spirit writes these words and expresses them. Different people in the first century would have heard this in different ways. The beautiful thing about this word, logos, we, we translate the word logos, word. But the beautiful thing about this word logos is that it had rich meaning at that time, but it had different meaning to different people. And I believe that God inspired John to begin the gospel this way, number one, because it would point people back to Genesis chapter one, the first creation. Remember how Genesis begins? In the beginning. How does John begin? In the beginning. Any ancient Jewish person would go, whoa, Genesis 1, new beginning, right? And, and so, so one group of people, uh, so if you say, well, what, what does this mean? What are they thinking about this, this term logos? That's right, the logos, the word, is in the minds of the Greek and Stoic philosophers, the rational principle governing the universe. The, the, the philosophers of the day, the Greek and Stoic philosophers, they use this term logos. So when John says, in the beginning was the Logos, their mind would have gone to a very specific place. I believe that God wanted their minds to go to that place because God wanted them to understand that it was, that, that was, was Jesus, is Jesus, is, is God the rational principle governing the universe? Well, kind of, but so much more. Not just that. But, but God is pure reason in our, in our irrational world. God stands and says what's right and what isn't and gives us a foundation to stand on. And, and so to the Greek and Stoic philosophers, when they, when they heard this part of the scriptures, their mind would perceive, okay, so you're saying that this word, this logos, came among us. They would have gone to a certain picture and an understanding of the logos. And, and I believe that God inspired it this way so that, that God could draw these people that were far from God, that didn't grow up in, the, in their Jewish heritage, they weren't looking for the Messiah, they were looking for a reason. God says, oh, I got reason for you. His name is Jesus. God with you. So, so that was part of the picture. But that's right. The Logos, the word is also in the Old Testament, in the poetic literature, like in the book of Proverbs, the Logos was the personification of wisdom, perfect wisdom. The wisdom that would stand on the city wall and say, come to me. Don't walk in folly. Don't walk in foolishness. Pursue me and walk and live in wisdom. The, 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 the Logos, the Word, that was that picture of the Logos, the Word, was, was this, this picture of wisdom leading people to right living. Well, does God offer perfect wisdom? What's the answer? Yes. Does God offer a path to walk on this the right way, the way of wisdom, a, away from the way of folly and the way of death and the way of life? Absolutely. That's part of the picture. But this word Logos is just, it's massive. And if you're in prayer and you say, oh, Word of God, Jesus, Word of God, God with me. And you think about God as the Logos. Even if you use that Greek word, oh, Logos. Because that's, that's the word that God inspired John to use to describe Jesus and his coming into human history. And, and so we say, well, yes, it, it, this perfect rational understanding, but also this wisdom that we need. But also, that's right, there's more. The Logos, the word, according to the book of Genesis, was the creative source of all things. How did God create the heavens and the earth? And God said... And God spoke. God created through his word. Well, we find out in John chapter 1 that that word is Jesus. That God in his own sovereign divine power spoke and created all things. So so when you say, God, I worship you as the Logos, if you say, you can pray, you can pray, oh, Jesus, Lamb of God. You pray, oh, God, Yahweh. You can say, oh, my God, my Lord, my God, word of God, Logos. Perfect understanding and reason in this unrational world. Perfect wisdom in this world of folly. Creator and sustainer of life. 
You are the word of God, our word. You can pray that way. Why? Because it's all wrapped up here. And then as you begin to walk through, uh, as you begin to walk through this passage, you just see item after item after item, truth after truth, kind of picture and description, one after another after another, kind of just rolling out of what it means to say that we worship the one who is the word, who is the logos. And so you know, there, there's, there, there's so much here. And I would just say compare fast food to your favorite restaurant or fast, compare, com, compare fast food to like your favorite cook. If, if you told me I got to pick a restaurant to eat at or if I could have my wife prepare my favorite meal that she makes, I wouldn't pick a restaurant. I would pick the option where my wife, who, who, when, she, when she makes Mexican the manicotti, you, when you put together the Mexican and the Italian, you know, she, she, they, she, she stuffs these manicotti noodles with meat and with beans, and then she, and she, and then she, oh, and then salsa, and she puts them, and then she has like sour cream over them, sharp cheddar cheese, and uh, chopped up black olives and scallions, and I could, I could go on, but I, I'll get all excited, and then I'll forget about what I'm preaching. But it's like, you, you know, but if, if you said to me, okay, do you want another burger at a fast food place, or do you want that meal? I go, no brainer, right? We're, as we walk through this picture of Jesus as the word of God, Here's my encouragement, that in the coming days, in your prayer life, because most of us as we pray, we get into kind of a prayer rut. Dear Lord, our Father God, it's so, is, is Jesus the Lord? Yes, amen. Is God our Father? Yes. Is it okay to pray, dear Lord, Father God? Sure it is. But you kind of spice it up a little bit when you go. So you go to prayer tomorrow morning, and you, and, you, and you just quiet yourself, and you say, Jesus, Word of God, Logos, you start there, it's going to take you to a little different place in prayer than maybe you're, the normal way you pray. So, so as you hear this, go, go deeper in your communication with God. Go deeper in your awareness of who God is. And so we're going to walk through this passage. And this is going to be, we're going to kind of just walk through it quickly. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. If you're not a note taker, you'll find out, if you find, look in the right place on the website, that all my notes for all my sermons, we put on the website. Did anybody know that? And I think sometimes they put them on before I preach. So don't get them before I preach, because then you're like, oh, I knew what he was going to say. But uh, so we're going to walk through this. So John chapter 1, verse 1. Our God, the Word, the Logos, is before all things. He is before all things. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when you begin this passage, in the beginning. So this, this God that we worship is eternal. This Jesus who we celebrate, who is the Word of God, exists before all things. Our God, the Word, the Logos, is united to the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. This is Trinitarian theology. We're not going to get tied into the, into the doctrine of the Trinity, but we believe as Christians that there is one God. We are monotheists. We believe in one God who is, is one in being. But he exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ, the Word of God who came among us, is in perfect union with the Father through all eternity past, for all eternity future. So the Word of God, our God, Jesus, is united to the Father. Our God, who is the Word, the Logos, is fully divine. Still in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We don't believe that Jesus was somehow subservient. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in persons, one in being, and united together eternally. So when you worship Jesus, you are worshiping the one who is fully God. When you worship the Spirit, you are worshiping the one who is fully God. When you worship the Father, you are worshiping the one who is fully God. And yet we don't worship three gods, we worship one God in perfect community. And there's a beauty to that because God calls us to walk in community and he models it for us as an eternal, God's like an eternal small group, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect community. And he calls us to walk in community also. And then we continue on. Our God, the Word, the Logos, is the creative source of all things. And that means everything. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. And all creation, all that we see, all that we experience, made by God. 
Now, because of the fall and sin, things aren't perfect. In perfect paradise, things were perfect. Now, the, 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 things are broken in our world, but God is the creator of all things. The beauty of animals, the wonder of flavors, sunsets and sunrises, the, the diversity and beauty of people. You know, even, if, even if you say, well, you know, yeah, everyone's different unless they're twins. It's like, well, I see Ramel back here. You've got identical twins. Are they identical? No. They're identical, but they're not identical, right? Um, quadruplets. Anybody with quadruplets in the room? Yeah. And, of course, not, all, not identical quadruplets, but you, know, but you go, okay, every single person, unique, beautiful, different. That's part of God's creation. So the Word of God is the one, it's through whom the Word, all things were created. Our God, the Word, the Logos, is the source of life. Look at verse 4. In him was life. That life was the light of all mankind. Physical life. Our physical life birthed through the word of God. Our spiritual life to be born again by the spirit of God and the word of God drawn to the arms of the Father. And abundant life comes through the word of God. And we get confused sometimes because we talk about, oh, this is, the, this is the word of God. Correct, this is the written word of God. But Jesus was the living word of God. And he, and he gave life to all things. And then our God, the word, the logos, is the source of light. Still in verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And God said, let there be light. And there was, there was physical light. But also God says, let there be light, and he brings spiritual light in dark places. If you need light in your life, light in your home, light in relationships where there's darkness. And in our world right now, man, our world needs the light of Jesus. Our world is getting darker and darker. And we just say, Lord Jesus, shine your light. Yes, you created the physical sun. Wonderful. But bring the light of your presence. And, the, and there's, you know, even, even on a night like tonight, you know, right now there's so much happening in our world that part of me is like, you know, do, do we need to stop and linger and talk about different things? And sometimes it's like, well, yes, but also um, there's always going to be challenges. But right now, I, I mean, I was, I've just been thinking the last couple of days about all the people in Afghanistan who would like to be somewhere else. And, and we need to say, Lord, bring your light there. You know, Sherry and I get correspondence from a ministry that we're on the board of a ministry that does work in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And they're sending us things, telling stuff that's happening on the ground. You know, and, and it's just like, Lord, the darkness and the conflict and the evil and the only thing at the end of the day that's going to redeem those situations is the presence of the light of Jesus. And so we need to, as you're, as you're praying, and can I, can I tell you, when, when you watch the news, when you get caught up in what's happening in the world, go through your, you know, there's things that may be difficult and, and make you sad or frustrate you, but don't ever let those emotions grow through your heart and not go to prayer. Man, if, Christi if Christians would spend as much time praying as we do stewing about what's happening in the world, it would have power. And, and will, you start, will you just start praying, word of God, who brings light and life, Bring your light and life to dark places like, like Afghanistan right now. Bring your light and life to dark places like this relationship I'm in that's really dark and broken. Bring your light and pray for the light of Jesus. Why? Because our God brings life and light. Amen? And so pray to God, to the God who says, I am life, I am light. Then pray for that and pray for him to unleash that in our world, in dark situations, in your own life, in the difficult places. And then our God, the Word, the Logos, has the power to conquer darkness and the forces of hell. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light of Jesus Christ, the light of the Word of God, shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And you say, but sometimes when I look from where I'm standing, it looks like the darkness has overcome it. I'm telling you, the darkness doesn't win. The enemy might win little skirmishes along the way. But we know how the story ends. And it ends with a throne. And we know who's on the throne. And it ends with victory. And it ends with all things that are wrong being made right. But we've got to pray that God will bring victory in those dark places and understand, and understand deep in our hearts that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The battle still rages, but we know who wins the battle. And then you move on to verse 14. 
The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. At least six sermons right there. Give me four minutes to preach them to you. Uh, we're going to be coming to the table for communion soon, and I invite you to start to prepare your heart. But I just want to walk you through this 14th verse. There is so much here. Again, the, the richness and the depth of what it means to pray, O oh Jesus, Word of God, Logos. We can pray to the one, our God, the Word, the Logos, is God in human flesh, incarnation. And, and, the, word, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word, the one through whom all the heavens were created, He was enfleshed. This is the incarnation. This is, this is John's Christmas story. The word became flesh. God came among us, the incarnation. He left the glory of heaven. He left the influence, the, the power, the praise to come and be with us and to be among us. And then our God, the word, the Logos, is the God who came near, who moved into the guest room, who moved right next door, who moved into our hearts. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This word who we worship, this word through whom all things were created, he made his dwelling among us. What does that mean? When we gather like this, every time we gather with God's people, every time we gather, whether you're online, out in the courtyard, in here, when we gather with God's people, the word of God is with us. We're going to preach the word of God, but you know what? You're going to experience the word of God. He is here. He is with you. He is among us. But when you're alone, he's present. By his spirit, he moves in and dwells with us. This God that we worship is so personal, so close, closer than any of us comprehend. I think, I think that when we are in glory someday, we're in heaven someday, God's going to take the curtain of eternity, kind of pull it back and show us our lives, and we're going to see God's presence in all these places. Where we, we, we went through a day and we went, man, look how I made it through that. And then God's going to go, hey, take a look. And you're going to go, whoa. <laughs> Lord, you, you, you saved my life four times that day. You know, I've often said, I think back to my junior high years, and I said, I don't know how I didn't die 50 times in my junior high years. I think God's going to say, no, it was actually 100 times. <laughs> um, long before I loved Jesus, his hand, his presence, he came near. Our God, the word, the Logos, is the source of glory. The source of glory. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. The glory of the word of God. Jesus Christ in all of his glory. We're going to be studying the book of Revelation in a few weeks. We're going to start a, a nine-week series in the book of Revelation leading up to Christmas time. And uh, you want to get a vision of the glory of Jesus. You read the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapters 20, chapters 21. Just, just the glory of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. We need to celebrate that. Our, word, our God, the word, the Logos, is the one and only Son. You say, well, when we become Christians, we become sons and daughters of God. Absolutely, we do. But he is the one and only son. We are adopted children. He's the eternal son of God. And we worship him as the son of God. Our God, the word, the logos, is the source of grace. And I want to tie these two together. And then the last one, our, our God, the, the word of the logos, is the source of truth. Who came, to the, who came from the Father, Jesus Christ, the one and only Son, who came from the Father, the end of verse 14, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. When you pray, O oh Jesus, Word of God, Logos, thank you that you have brought to my life grace and truth. You speak the truth that I was lost and I was broken and I couldn't make it to you on my own. And you brought grace you paid the price, you washed me clean, and you called me your own. That God, you didn't look the other way and ignore my sin. He's a God of truth. Amen? You didn't, you didn't ignore my sin, but you dealt with my sin. And by grace, you paid the price. I think of the woman caught in adultery, where, where the religious leaders in Jesus' day bring this woman to Jesus, and they say she was caught in the very act of adultery. No question, sinful, caught. It's interesting if she was caught in the, the act of adultery, why only the woman was there and not the man. But that's a whole other sermon. But, go, but here's this woman caught in the act. And what does Jesus do? I love this. Grace and truth. Truth and grace. He says to the crowd, whichever one of you has never sinned, you throw a stone at her. Because she had broken the law. 
the, the religious law. One by one, they dropped the stones, the Bible says, starting with the oldest, and walked out of the courtyard. Why did the oldest drop the stones first and leave? I think because, number one, they had more time to be sinful, <laughs> and also I think they were a little bit wiser and realized, oh, if I condemn her, I'm condemned. Until everyone left, and here's Jesus, kind of kneeling down, drawing in the sand. We don't know what he's drawing. And this woman standing there in the judgment of her sin. And Jesus looks up and he says, where are they, woman? Is there no one left to condemn you? She says, no one, Lord. Except for there was one left in that courtyard. Jesus. You know what he says? Now go and leave your life of sin. Truth and grace brought together, right? Jesus, you are the Logos, the Word of God. We thank you that you love us, that you are the God of grace and the God of truth, that you are light and you are life. You are Emmanuel, God with us. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will speak to our hearts. We pray that you will help us pray in deeper ways. That as we draw near to you, we will come to you and, and pray, dear Lord, we will pray, Heavenly Father, we will pray, Lamb of God, but I pray that we will live with a fresh vision in our lives, having dined on your word, and that it just might be from this point going forward, that there would be moments where we would just stop and we would say, Jesus, Logos, Word of God, bring your light, bring your life, show your glory, reveal your grace. Lead me in grace and in truth. But open our eyes to see you in fresh ways. And now, as we come to the table, as we get a vision of you, Lord Jesus, Word of God, the perfect sacrifice, the price that was paid, open our ears to hear your Word. Open our hearts to feel your love and your grace. Open our eyes to see you. Open our mouths to taste of the cup, of the bread, and of the life and light you bring in this experience of communion. Speak to our hearts. This is the word of God from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I can hear in the worship center you're already preparing the elements. If you haven't yet, we invite you to open your elements and take out the wafer and open the cup. If you're in the courtyard as well, and if you're at home, to gather some elements to partake in communion with us. This communion that we celebrate, this sacrament of the Christian church, is for the believers, those of us who are followers of Jesus. Whether you call Shoreline Church your home or you attend another Bible-believing church, we invite you to participate with us. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you hadn't made that decision to, to make Jesus Lord of your life, we, we invite you to sit and to watch and to get a feel for what this means to us. One of the holiest and greatest um, sacraments that we participate in our faith. There's something that can happen when you do something regularly. If every month you're with us at night of worship, every month you take part in communion, it can become kind of a routine. We don't want that to happen. There should be things happening inside of us in these moments as we prepare to take the elements. I would suggest that when you hold the bread, when you take the cup, 
that you do exactly what Jesus said. Remember Jesus. In these moments right here, remember when you first saw his face. Remember when you first understood. This isn't just for my parents, my grandparents. This is for me. He died for me. Remember the life he lived, the way he loved people and walked with people, the way he healed. Remember Jesus. That's part of what this is about. So take time to do that. This is also a time to reflect on our own lives. Say, Lord, if there's an area of my life where I'm running from you or rebelling against you, I just bring it and I set it at your feet. You whose body was broken, you whose blood was shed, to show your grace. I don't want to take that lightly. lightly. I want to take this moment to confess, to lay these things at your feet. and Let the Spirit search your heart. And if even right now there's a, something that the Holy Spirit's just saying, you need to bring this and put it at the foot of the cross. You need to bring this to Jesus. Yes, you've come to faith. Yes, you're saved. But then you're kind of wandered off the path. And this is the time to say, Lord, bring me back. God will speak the truth and point it out. God will show you grace and remind you that he's forgiven you. And then also in communion, there's a beautiful aspect of community. We don't share communion alone. Even if you're online and you're at home and you're by yourself and you're holding a piece of bread and you're holding a cup with, with some juice or some wine in it, you're not alone. We're partaking as the body of Christ. And so think about what it means to be part of this body. We partake of communion in community because it is communion with God, but it's also communion with His family. So just enjoy sharing this experience in community with God's people. The bread that we partake of represents the body of Jesus. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus chose to use bread. Like this was at the end of the meal where they had a lot of food. He could have picked anything. He could have said, let's use the lamb because I'm the lamb of God. But he chose bread. Bread that for thousands of years in cultures and communities and people groups around the world has been a staple. You can find this maybe as a big loaf or as a tortilla, or, or a pita, or a lavash. Around the world, people know the importance of bread. And Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will not go hungry. So as we partake of this bread, we remember that this represents the broken body of Jesus. The word made flesh who came among us who lived a sinless life and then he gave it up for us. He made that sacrifice and gave us that gift. I invite you to partake of the bread. this cup which we bless is our communion with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus was and still is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in the truth, Jesus, the Word of God, recognized your sin and mine. In the truth, and because He has perfect reason and He understands what's going on in our lives. He understood that we couldn't pay the price for our sins. The book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But all the offerings that came before Jesus were not enough to pay for our sins. They were just a foreshadowing of what would come. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, on the cross, let his body be broken and his blood be shed. He did it for us. As we partake of this cup together, we remember the price that Jesus paid. In truth, he looked closely at our sins and said, you can't fix this. In grace, he took our place. He took our punishment. He took our shame. And now we partake and remember what he's done for us. Let's partake of the cup together.
Lord Jesus, we worship you. We praise you. And Lord, our response now, as we sing together, is to come into your presence, is to lift our voices, to lift our hearts, to lay our lives down, because you've given everything for us. Jesus, Logos, Word of God, you have looked at us in truth. You have loved us with grace. You have saved us with your own life. And now we just remember that our lives are yours. We take up our cross. We deny ourselves. We follow you every day, every day, every day until one day we walk into your arms. Until then, Lord, let us celebrate you, the Word, the Logos, our Jesus. If you're able to stand in the spirit of worship, would you stand? Would you join your hearts? Would you join your voices? Would you join your lives as we worship the Lord?